everybody and welcome to or welcome back to the Squiggly Careers podcast. I am Helen, I am one half of the Squiggly Careers team. I'm not joined by Sarah who is the normal other half of the team today but I'm joined by um, somebody who is an absolute inspiration to me in my career and we'll hear more about that and somebody whose career has included a diversity of things from stand-up, TV presenting, broadcasting, journalism, CEO and now the Executive Dean of Edinburgh Business School. There's so much that we'll get into but today I'm joined by Heather McGregor. Thank you, it's lovely to be here and thank you for coming to meet me. You had to come quite a long way to do it. Um, Yes, so we are doing a podcast today at Edinburgh Business School which is so quiet because all the students have gone. Yes, it's the summer holidays and it's lovely, peaceful, quiet campus, 300 acres of beautiful Scottish countryside. It's absolutely lovely though. I did see quite a lot of foreign students who are very excited to be here and it, it made me think, gosh, I remember being 13 or 14 and I'm going on summer school yeah yeah yeah, we're on summer language (laughs) school that's how universities put their assets to work in the downtime is make sure you have lots of summer schools running so it's not entirely quiet but it's a very different atmosphere I guess to the normal time Uh, so today's podcast to give you a bit of a shortcut to what we're going to be talking about there are so many things that I could talk to Heather about but we've got about sort of 40 minutes for the podcast so I've got to narrow it down we're really going to focus on squiggly careers and dive in a little bit into Heather's squiggly career and talk specifically about um, networking also about learning in your career a couple of key topics to talk about and then we're actually going to go into careers and finance and thinking a little bit about salaries negotiations savings pensions all of that kind of stuff I promise you if you're listening and you're thinking "Mm, finance doesn't sound like the most interesting topic Heather's book which is called financial advice for independent women is the funniest book I have ever read on finance. I don't actually think I've read many funny books on finance, but it is, I promise, laugh out loud funny. I was recapping it on the on the plane when I was coming here last night, actually laughing to myself reading it. So Thank it's you. brilliant. But before we start, I wanted to share uh, with you listening and also as a thank you to Heather, the impact that Heather's work, particularly the writing, has had on my career. And I was reflecting on it this morning, actually, and I was I don't think I'd even consciously realised it, but I'm only sat here today because of you and your first book, Careers Advice for Ambitious Women. Wow, so tell us why. So the book came out in 2012, and I think I must have read it in the beginning of 2013, and I was just leaving BP, and I'd been doing a global marketing role for BP. I'd been travelling an awful lot. I'd lived away from my husband. I'd... It was an amazing role because, you know, I was working in China, and it was so interesting, but I didn't have much of a life outside of work. I was just working a lot and that had become basically my identity was sort of work. And I decided that it wasn't quite the right thing for me. I wanted to go and see something different and I went to work for Virgin. And so there was this point in 2013 where I was working for Virgin and I realised I want to do more than work, but I'm not quite sure what it is. And I read two books at that time. I read The Start of You by Reid Hoffman and I read your book, Careers, Advice for Ambitious Women. And there was a bit in your book, there were lots in your book, but there was a bit about having a third dimension. Yes. And about how having something outside of work that you do, whether it's, um, you know, volunteering or side projects can help to build your profile and build your network. And I thought that's what I need. I need a third dimension. And um, my business partner, Sarah, had also read the book. I can't remember who recommended it to who, but we sat down at some point in um, 2013 towards the end of the year and we were talking about the book and our careers and some of the side projects Sarah had already started doing this leadership program on the side to help people and somewhere in that conversation came out the statement wouldn't it be amazing if we could make work better for everyone as we identified that careers weren't this kind of linear predictable thing anymore they were much more squiggly much more changeable that was great if you had the skills to succeed in it but if you didn't know how to network and you didn't know what your strengths were it could feel a bit daunting so we were like well let's help people with that and I think that book was a spark so thank you number one because I don't think I'd be amazing if it's now my full-time job (laughs) as of last year and I don't think I don't think I'm not sure it would have existed if I had if we hadn't had that spark Mm. that's amazing and then the second thank you is in 2015 I applied for an MBA scholarship through the Women in uh, Leadership Scholarship that the 30% Club in the Financial Times yes, runs, yes. which you, I know that you were one of the founding members of the steering yes. committee. And, and I, was, I was originally one of the judges of that scholarship for uh, the first few years that it existed, but probably not by the time you got there. Yes. So I applied and was given the scholarship in 2015 and I finished my MBA uh, last year and it was through that. And I adore learning and I love doing my MBA and it was something I'd wanted to do for a while and that provided me with the impotence and the finance to be able to do it so big two big thank yous that 
career-wise, I wouldn't have if I think it wasn't for your work. Oh, well, thank you very much. And while we're on the subject of MBAs, let's not um, move away from that just for a minute. Mm. Because, first of all, in Careers Advice for Ambitious Women, Chapter 1 talks about human capital mm. and the importance of reskilling and retraining. And, and I wrote that, as you said, in 2012, long before I came to run a business school. And I talked in there about the value of an MBA and what I felt the value of an MBA was. And the reason that I came to run a business school was to make it possible for lots more women to do an MBA. So if people are listening to this a long way from the United Kingdom, they should know that I now have 10,000 students studying in 160 countries and that the Edinburgh Business School was set up to enable people to do MBAs in places that the other parts couldn't reach. You yeah. know? I mean, it was, there, we have people who are sent to Brunei because their husband is a helicopter pilot for an oil rig and who don't know what to do with that three-year break that they've got to go abroad and who study with us. We have people who... Um, are sitting in a bedroom in Surrey. Uh, Sabrina Stocker, the one of the candidates on The Apprentice last year, started part-time with us by building up her business in tennis event management. And I think that you give a woman an MBA, you change her life forever, mm. which is, I think, your experience of yeah, it. Yeah, and the people that you meet and learn from, and I love learning, so for me it was like this conduit for learning in a structured way for three years. But it just also fulfilled an ambition and, and it, my background's in marketing and I tend to, to study a bit in there and it just widens what you're learning a little bit more. So whether it's organisational behaviour or accounting, not my strong point, which is why I found your book so enlightening when it was on finance. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I love doing it. So yeah, just a very big, a big thank you. So I reeled off some of the many different things that you have done in your career, which I would describe as very squiggly. And I think some things that I didn't mention along the way, you have an MBA, you have a PhD in structured finance. I do, yes. <laughs> you also learned to be a pilot. Yes. That's <laughs> quite a few things. I got my pilot's license in, uh, when I was 47, 10 years ago. But I define my career as having essentially 10 years at a time chapters. And mm. in my 20s, my career was very focused in communications. And I worked in communications for, I worked in an advertising agency, I worked in a company managing their communications with the outside world, principally with their shareholders, mm -hmm. but with lots of external uh, stakeholders, including their banks and so forth. In doing that, I realised that a lot of people were working in finance who I didn't think were, frankly, any cleverer than me. I mean, I didn't think I was that clever, but I thought they were less clever. And I thought if I wanted to achieve my potential, I should join them. And so my route to doing that was to do an MBA. Mm -hmm. So I carried on with my day job. And like you, I studied for my MBA while working and having a family. And it's not easy and it requires discipline. And then when I got my MBA, the minute I got my MBA, I went and got a job working in the, in an investment bank. Mm -hmm. And then the next 10 years were really characterized by that. Was I worked in an investment bank. I worked all over the world. I worked for just one employer that whole time, but they moved me from function to function and all around the world. And then we came to another watershed at the end of that decade when I decided I wanted to own my own business. Mm. Um, and I wanted to own a business that I had first come across when I was 23. So when I was 23, I was approached for a job in an advertising agency by a headhunter. Now, at 23 years old, you've got to remember I'm very old. So when I was 23, this was 1985. And I thought you got jobs by looking in the newspaper and applying yeah. for ads. There was no such thing as the internet in those days. So I was very shocked. Also, there were just to remind your listeners, which may come as a great surprise to many of them, that in 1985, there were no mobile telephones. <laughs> so if you wanted to actually telephone somebody, they had to be at their desk when you telephoned them and answered. And so I answered my telephone and the person at the other end said, you don't know me, but my name is Airdrie Taylor and I wondered if you'd like to talk to me about a job that we think you might be interested in. I thought, wow... Yeah. So how did they find out about you? Because they, they there was I no was LinkedIn. recommended by okay. someone who'd interviewed me for an article in the Financial Times first yeah. it happened. But they this chap had interviewed me about my research. I was doing some research at the time. And he'd interviewed me about my research and he'd recommended me to these girls who were running a headhunting company. Anyway, I went to London to see them and talk about the job. I asked them if they'd pay my train fare, yeah. and they did. So I thought, wow, free trip to London. <laughs> uh, and when I was talking to them in their offices, which were on the third floor of a 
uh, of a walk up in High Hoban. And I remember that very vividly, actually. And thinking, this is the job I actually want. Forget the job in the advertising agency, which I went for and got and, and went to do. But what I really wanted to do was work for them. And you realised that at 23 when you yes. went for the interview, yes. but you still took the other job. I still took the other job because they didn't have a job. Uh-huh. They, they, they were, were a four-person company in, yeah. and they'd only started in 82. That They were still very small in yeah. 85. Um, what was it, do you think? That you, did you, was it in them or was it the role specifically of headhunting that appealed to you? It was the role of headhunting and it was the thought that you might actually look at people's careers and find great talent for people but also find great opportunities for people so you know it was a win-win on both sides Mm -hmm. you you found great people for the company but at the same time there were great opportunities for the people and I knew at 23 I wanted to have a big impact on other people's careers and that still drives me at the age of 57. Where do you think that comes from and how you knew at 23 when did you start knowing that? In that room at that time, I realised then that I wanted to help people make the most of their potential and I realised that a lot of people don't even know what they don't know. So they don't know what the career opportunities are. They don't actually know what careers are out there. I don't know anybody who at university has thought, I want to be a headhunter. I think I've met two or three people who have known enough about talent and HR, but they're very, very few. You know, mm. There are so many careers out there and roles and responsibilities that people don't know about. So I did vow, I made it, as I walked down those three flights of stairs <laughs> in 1985, I vowed on the spot that one day I would go back and I would buy that company. Wow. Mm. And when I'd done 10 years or nearly 10 years in investment banking, I rang them up and said... I'm still keen on my 23-year-old promise. So you'd let them know this promise? I'd let them know, okay. yes, yes. It wasn't out of the blue 10 years later? No, it wasn't out of the blue. And I stayed in touch with them all at that time. I yeah. mean, good headhunters do that anyway, yes. stay in touch with their candidates. So I stayed in touch with them all that time. And in fact, they'd sponsored my MBA project. OK. Um, and they moved from High Hoban to somewhere very close to Oxford Circus, which was very handy when I went shopping. <laughs> I could drop in and see them, use the loo, that kind of thing. Good planning. And I'd always stayed in touch with them. And then I rang them up in 2000 and said, I've had enough of investment banking and I want to buy the company and they said well you know um, how about coming to work here first <laughs> so I went to work there I finally went to work there you know so I met them in 1985 and I went to work there in 2000 I bought 20% of the company in 2002 mm-hmm. and the rest of the company in 2004 so I did achieve my goal yeah. in the end and in the books, I found it so interesting as well, the, the way that you financed. Because I think a lot of people think, might be thinking, well, I could never buy a company. And I, I think it was a £1.8 million it was investment. £1.8 million, pounds and I, I borrowed it all, but I borrowed some of it from them. Yeah. And that's very normal, actually. And what is slightly unnormal is that I structured it all myself. So mm-hmm. I took the deal to them and structured it all myself and said, this is what I want to do. I want to buy the company, I'll give you some cash now, and I'll give you the rest of the cash over time. So effectively borrowing the money from them. And that's a very normal way to transfer a business that is essentially a people business. It's a human capital business. There was no factory. Mm-hmm. There was, there was, they didn't own the building that they were in. All that there was actually was the name. Yeah. Um, and the network you know, and, the and the people. network of the 22 years of working in this area mm. um, at the time that I bought it. You know, they set it up in 82. I finally bought the whole company in 2005. So, you know, by that stage, it was 22, 23 years after they set it up. I'm interested when you said that, uh, I think it was at 17 years, it made me think. So the change in 2016 was when you came up here, which was um, when you kind of moved on from the organisation. that yes. I grown, And at the same time, stopped the columns at Mrs Moneypenny. Did I did stop time? writing Mrs Moneypenny at the same time in 2016. I have started other things, though, things that I think are more suitable for a professor and their head. Ah, I was about to say, because they were quite, they must have felt like a big part of your internal identity and let alone the external identity. And then to stop them and start something new, how does that feel? I think stopping and starting things are always important, but I think it's important to have a hard stop and to have the decision is your decision. I think mm. the harder times are when the decision is not your decision. And some of my decisions about my career in my life have not been my decision. You know, sometimes opportunities are just not there for you or stop being there for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I always think that change is perfectly all right when you've planned it mm. and executed it yourself. It's much less disturbing so I took the decision to stop writing for the Financial Times in 2016 I felt it was incompatible with being a serious professor Mm -hmm. also the 
burden of writing about your life every single week for 17 years. You know, I had been writing that column longer than I'd been a headhunter. So I started writing that column in 1999 when I was an investment banker in Japan. And the original columns were called Email from Tokyo. And, you know, a long time ago now, but it's like having a family diary, reading, <laughs> reading them through. But I, I thought, right, well... You know, that's not appropriate anymore. I don't think that people are really wanting to read about my personal life anymore and about my balance, my juggling with work. And also I started writing the column in 99, as I said, when I when I was still in my 30s. And then I was a young working mother in my 30s. Mm-hmm. And I think I had a lot of currency with a lot of other young working mothers in their 30s. By the time I stopped writing it, I was well into my 50s. And my children were, were all, you know, much, much older. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't in the same position. So I think it was the right thing to do. I have picked up two other things that I do, though. So once a month, I write for the BBC World Service. Mm-hmm. And it goes out on their um, World Business Report program as a written Say I took that over from Lucy Callaway, actually, who mm-hmm. had been with me at the FT. And I enjoy doing that. And, and interestingly, this month I've written about the skills of the future. I saw that off the Deutsche announcement. I was looking on Twitter and I saw that they'd written yes. a piece on that. Yeah. So I, I wrote a... I, in the same day as the Deutsche announcement, I released a, a, an audio essay about the skills of the future. Mm. And then the other thing I have that not many people know about, but only if you live in Scotland and only if you fly Logan Air, <laughs> is that I am the a management correspondent for Logan Air's in-flight magazine. This is the height of my media career. <laughs> and if you are flying in a Logan Air plane and uh, you're in some little plane on the way to Orkney or Shetland or Look uh, somewhere, out for... <laughs> yeah, fish that magazine out of the back of the seat in front because there will be a picture of me and my views about how running a business are very, very like flying a plane. I'd love to pick up on the, the point you said about you that do, you can't do things alone. I think it's a really interesting point to kind of dive into on networking. And again, in reading the books, it seems that you have a really strong network, both in terms of the professional network, but also the support network, whether it's your husband or you mentioned your, the different friends that you've got. And as a... Somebody, you know, I was previous at Microsoft now, an amazing full time. I've got two young children, and I definitely invest in my network. But I actually think I struggle to have the personal. I have a very, very small group of personal friends because I don't have a lot of time for motherhood, company networking, and you know, building more personal friends. So I was really inspired by how you seem to have a great group of personal friends and a really strong career network. And I, I've picked up some tips in the books, but for everybody else, where do people start with networking? When we talk to people, it's something they definitely find tricky. Well, the first thing I would do is to stop using the word as a verb. Ah. Yeah, you know, I don't like using the word as a verb. I use it as a noun. You know, I build a network. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you've got to also understand that not everybody in your network has got to be your best friend. Mm-hmm. I define my network as somebody who would return my telephone call or my email. So I would consider myself to be in your network and you in mine because when you wrote and asked me to do this podcast, I returned your your email. And we didn't even know each other. So just because you don't know somebody doesn't mean they're not in your network because you probably got, as we had, you know, one stage removed connection Mm -hmm. somewhere Mm -hmm. um, that you could write about it or there is some way of reaching each other in that network. So recently, for instance, I wanted my students here to visit the beautiful new Victorian Albert Museum in Dundee, which has just been finished. And it was a 10-year project, and I wanted our project management students to go and meet the project manager that had, had overseen it. And I didn't know anybody at the V&A in Dundee, so mm-hmm. I looked at the board of directors on the internet and saw that the chairman was a lady who had previously been the chairman of a company called Alliance Trust. And I knew that Catherine Garrett-Cox had been the CEO of there and I knew Catherine Garrett Cox. So I wrote to Catherine and asked for an introduction to the lady who was the chair. So she wasn't in my network, mm. but I was able to reach her through somebody who was in my network. And at the end of the story is very happy. The students all went to see, they met the project manager, they had a fabulous day in Dundee. I recommend to everybody who can get there <laughs> to go and look at the Victorian Albert Museum in Dundee. But that is another way of also saying another piece of advice. So building a network is only the beginning of the story. Mm. There is two other critical parts of it one is maintaining it so if you build a network how are you going to maintain it you know nothing annoys me more than people who work for me for instance and then I don't hear they leave or I leave or whatever I don't hear from them for three or four years and then I get an email saying can you please give a reference for Mm. somebody 
everybody should have somebody from every stage of their life they stay in touch with and who could give them a reference they just they don't have to be your best friends they don't have to be invited to your children's weddings or your wedding but if i was to ask you who at bp would give you a reference now you would Mm. be able to tell me somebody Mm. and you you have stayed in touch with somebody there it doesn't have to be someone you work for it could be somebody you work with yeah and there would be somebody at virgin as well yeah so it's very important that you stay in touch with those people now I personally think Christmas is a great time to stay in touch with people on a a once-a-year basis, but it doesn't have to be Christmas. I publish a magazine here called Pam Your House Perspectives, all about our research here and to keep people in touch with Pam Your House, which is the last home of Adam Smith that I spent my first part of my job here restoring. And that, to me, is an opportunity. When that comes out, I take the opportunity to write to lots of people saying, Mm. hello, hello, I'm still here, I'm running a business called in Scotland, and make sure that I actually get back in touch with people about once a year yeah building a network is one thing and remember that you you know not everyone has to be your best friend you just need to think about what in the academic literature is called weak ties you're more likely to find about about job opportunities for people you don't know that well Mm -hmm. because people you know that well know everything that you know you share everything but people who don't know that well come across information that you don't so Weak ties are very important to build in your network. Number two, maintaining it. Mm -hmm. People aren't going to return your telephone call and email if they haven't heard from you for five years. And then finally, using it. So building it and maintaining it are critical parts of a network. But using it, that is a, a real skill and something to remember. And what all the academic work shows is that people don't really like using their network and in fact they'd rather only contact people for help they knew extremely well Mm. but that pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to email someone that you know but don't know that well to ask for an introduction to someone you don't know at all to ask for a favor to send your students to a visit that is a disciplined approach you know you need when you use your network especially your weak ties that don't know you that well The key piece of advice is write a very, very specific email Mm -hmm. or letter or phone call so that people know exactly what they're being asked for, make it very easy for them to say yes, and in fact, put it all together in an email that allows them to just press forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you will find it much easier to get the help from your network. So people need to build a network, they need to maintain a network, and they need to know how to use it. I think those using tips are brilliant. My business partner is actually amazing at using a network. She's um, an introvert, so we often talk about how this isn't an introvert-extrovert thing. Your introverts can build very, very effective networks. Mm. And she's fantastic at using it. I think I'm good at maintaining it, as is she. But sometimes I have that, ooh, there's some kind of a, a confidence gremlin, we would call it, that sometimes stops me using it. And that's probably my development area because I have a really strong network from a the people, the variety, they're invested in me in some way, but I don't always leverage it, so I will take that. And just as um, one of my favourite, the networking stories in the book is when um, it's in Career Advice for Ambitious Women, not just for women as well, there's loads in there that anyone can use, is when you said that there was an event that you wanted to go to, and I think it might have been because you'd come off maternity, but you'd stop being able to go to certain events. And I stopped being asked That to was events. it. That w- Honestly, I, when I left being an investment banker, and remember, I didn't buy the company straight away. I first of all just went to work there, and it was a nine-person company um, around the back of the BBC. You know, there was no dishwasher. Uh, there was nobody from IT coming to fix your computer. Uh, there was no air conditioning. I mean, I worked, went from an investment bank by Liverpool Street Station in a state-of-the-art building to a little out-of-nowhere office around the back of the BBC, north of Oxford Circus, and nobody asked me to anything anymore. Mm -hmm. So I was so upset by that, and I realised that those kind of opportunities, being seen and getting people to remember that you were still in the flow was very important. Mm. So, yes, you're referring to the story when I went to the Smaller Company Awards at the Grosvenor House in Park Lane, and I hadn't been asked, and I couldn't work out how to get in there. Then I realised that, of course, lots of people leave to smoke at these events. They go in, they hand in their ticket, and then they leave to smoke. Now, I've never smoked, but I went and bought a packet of cigarettes and a lighter. I don't know where I got the lighter from. (laughs) You really put... You took props. Yeah, I took props. And I put a a strapless evening gown on and it was March, so it was very cold outside and nobody went outside without a coat on unless it was to smoke. And I went down to the Grosvenor House in Park Lane clutching nothing but a packet of cigarettes and a lighter. And I walked in and they just assumed, which only goes to show you how dangerous assumptions are again, that 
I had been out for a cigarette. That I'd obviously come in, handed my coat into the cloakroom, handed my ticket in, and then gone out for a cigarette because nobody in their right mind would be standing on Park Lane <laughs> uh, in a strapless evening gown in m- March, you know, in freezing cold. It was like five degrees out there. It was ridiculous. And to then I went in. And when I got him, the first thing I did was, because it was the pre-dinner drinks, was I walked around to say hello to everybody I knew and it was really nice to catch up with lots of people again in the public company world. And then they called dinner. And actually, my original plan had only been to go to the drink. Okay. Um, and they, <laughs> they, they called dinner and I thought, oh, dinner. And I rushed over to the seating plan because there was a big seating plan on a board, you know, this Grosvenor House seats a 1,000 people, mm-hmm. and to see who'd got tables. And I realised that the Financial Times had a table. And, of course, I, know, I was writing a column for them at the time. When you write a column for a paper, you don't work there. Yeah. You know, you send the column in. You go in from time to time, but you don't work there. You don't know that many people there. Anyway, I saw that there was a table with the Financial Times and I thought oh I'll just nip down so I nipped down into the main body of the dining area just as people were starting to go down and I got hold of a catering person and I said would he lay an extra chair because it was very embarrassing we'd had someone turn up that we weren't expecting and so they went and got an extra chair and laid an extra place and then I sat down and waited for the other 10 people who were really meant to be on the table to turn up thinking that they would be somebody from editorial but of course they were all from the commercial team who had no idea who I was <laughs> anyway we, we, we all got along famously and it it all worked out brilliantly and it was incredibly helpful evening for my career and my business but it had taken yes using props and some ingenuity yeah. to get the extra chair laid I think that that's the there's like an overlaying for yours which is this ingenuity and and I know you might think it's obvious but even thinking okay well I'll look at who's the board of directors and maybe who do I know that knows that person and who can make the introduction it's creative in for the way that you build it's about relationships. Pr- planning and preparation mm. and I think that you know utilizing a network is that is something that needs planning and preparation mm. and when I teach people I've run workshops on how to build a network and I founded my own foundation charitable foundation back in 2008 to help a minority ethnic young people to access careers in the UK and I still teach on that I mean that is a completely independent charity now uh, independent of me independent of everything but I still teach on their programme that I originally devised. It's a 10-week programme for people who've left university and are struggling to get access to communications careers. And the thing I teach them that is how to build a network Mm. and also how to maintain it and how to utilise it. And what I find is that when I'm teaching it, the first thing I teach is how to prepare to meet somebody. I mean, you came to meet me today having very well prepared. I mean, you'd read my books, you'd read everything about me. You wouldn't have come here today unless you knew quite a lot about me because that was the professional intent. Mm -hmm. But maybe you might just come to something I'm speaking at, in which case you wouldn't have done all of this prep in advance. But actually, doing the prep in advance, even of going to hear someone speak, means that when you do get that chance to meet them after the speech, Mm -hmm. you know exactly what... If you know all about them, you'll know exactly which bit of their life you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And you can make the conversation, that few minutes of conversation you'll have, really worthwhile. Mm, I find actually looking at social media, if anyone's ever speaking and I think I'd love to start a conversation with that person, often if I look at social media, that person's account beforehand, I can sort of see what's top of mind to them at the moment, whether they've been writing or are they really interested in politics and it, it's a really quick way of finding out it things. Is, it's a first and absolutely essential way of doing it and if you've only got a few minutes, that's exactly, you know, in the bus on the way to the event, you know, that's what you should do is mm. look at their Twitter feed, look at their Instagram, look at something. Mm. Mm. Uh, and if you've got more time, then the best way to find information out about people is ask someone who knows them already. Mm-hmm. I have used Google Alerts before as well. If someone's speaking or they've written something, if I'm really interested in that person's thinking, it's a way that I can stay on top of, okay, they've got a new book coming out or they're going to speak at that event or different ways. Um, I'd love, um, with the time I've got left, to segue a little bit into careers and finance and careers and financial literacy and whether you just talked about the RPC you'd written for the World Service whether there's something happening in the world of work that makes that more important, or whether it's just as important as it ever was. I've always thought finance was really important to careers because I think it's financial challenges that stop people sometimes. And I encourage people to think about what does their life really cost them. So actually go and write down, you know, what do you actually need to live on? And what could you live on if you made some changes in your life, maybe? Mm. 
And then if you are able to earn a lower salary, then you've probably got many more options open to you. You've got different ways of earning a living. You could set up your own company, maybe, if you could do that, or retrain or go into a full-time MBA somewhere or whatever it is that you want to do, if you know what you absolutely need. So if, for instance, you work out that you absolutely need a certain amount of money to just pay the bills for you know a year and you want to study for something for a year, you could borrow exactly that amount of money. Mm-hmm. Um, Mm. And but thinking, oh, I couldn't possibly give up my job because you know I couldn't afford to. Well, could you afford to? Have you ever sat down and worked it out? You know, and if you haven't got a family that's absolutely rooted to the spot in that area, or if you're on your own or whatever, could you move somewhere else? If you live in an expensive part of the world like London, could you move out and rent out your flat and go and live somewhere cheaper while you study Mm. um, and fund yourself that way? So I think people need to think really carefully about what they earn. And that's why money and careers are inextricably linked, because one is completely bound up in the other and if I have a piece of financial advice for anybody for everybody on listening it is spend one hour a week on your own finances never accept that insurance quote when it comes in never accept that satellite tv renewal when it comes in make sure that you look at everything that you spend and I'm not in the camp of don't buy a cup of coffee every day and then you can afford to go on holiday buying that nice cup of coffee uh, you know in a high street shop is if it's your treat for the day, that's your treat for the day. You'll save hundreds of cups of coffee if you renegotiated your electricity and gas contract. Or your phone bill. You or your phone that, bill, or your mobile phone bill, or your satellite connection, or whatever it mm. is. You know, focus on the big things, and the small things will look after themselves. But coming back to money and career, so understanding what it costs you to live. The other thing is understanding how long you're going to live. Um, If you were born since 2000 in the United Kingdom, you have, if you're a girl, a life expectancy of 104 and a boy of 102. And that means that you're going to live for a long time. And it means also that you won't have access to a defined benefit pension scheme or a final salary pension scheme, which are have gone the way of the dinosaurs Mm. now. And, you know, no one gets access to them these days or virtually nobody. And certainly by the time that those people are in their 70s, 80s and 90s, it won't be possible to Mm. have those kind of pension schemes. So as a result, everybody's either got to win the lottery or work for a very long time. And... If you're going to work for a very long time, to have a career that spans 40 or 50 years, you're going to have to retrain at various stages. So you need to think about, can I afford to stop and retrain? And the other thing you need to think about is how are you going to finance yourself You know, when you are older? And I don't just mean how you're going to finance your personal care and your long-term care and so forth when, you know, in the last 10 to 20 years of your life. I mean, how are you going to afford to retire? Mm. I just went and got the illustration of what my pension will be when I retire. And everyone can do that in the UK. You can go, there's a government website that you can go to, you put your national insurance number in, and it will tell you how up to date you are with your national insurance contributions. And it will tell you what you're going to earn when you retire. Now, I'm, I have fully paid up my national insurance contributions, including with all my career breaks. So when you take a career break or do something different, like running your own Mm -hmm. podcast company, you need to be absolutely certain you're still paying your class three voluntarily, your class three national insurance contributions, Mm -hmm. because that will mean it possible to get your full pension. Now, my full pension at the point at which I retire is going to be about £175 a week. And that's the most it will ever be, my state pension. Mm. And, you know, we're very privileged to live in a country with a state pension. But living on £175 a week, including rent, gas, electricity, everything you want in your life, that's clearly would be a challenge for me. And I need to be making other provision about mm-hmm. it. And I've been paying into a pension since I was 25. Mm. There were lots of periods where I stopped. When I bought the company and I had to pay back £1.8 million, I stopped for nearly 10 years. Yeah. And I've struggled ever since to catch up. But I really encourage people every pound you'll put away before you're 30 is worth 100 pounds afterwards more or less and it's a really important thing to do to have some kind of saving scheme for the future and so many organizations i remember um have kind of matched contribution pensions don't they and i remember my early career i thought well (laughs) <laughs> I laugh at myself now, but I thought, well, I won't go to the max that I could do because that's extra money that I could keep back. And it just kind of missed opportunity. Whereas, you know, my last role at Microsoft, I put in as much as I could so that they would match it as much as I could. It's interesting now, I need to now running Amazing If Full Time I don't have that match company contribution. So I've now got to think about my pension in a, in a slightly different way. And I do find that interesting in the um, 
changing shape of work. So people may be moving from a corporate role like I did to do their own thing, or maybe they're going to freelance. Sometimes I think there's a comfort or there's a ready-made thing that goes when you work for a company there's like a ready-made pension thing that you just sign and then people are maybe trying on these different modes of work and not necessarily investing in or I need to go and have a personal pension but it's never been more important to I think invest it's never been more important because the support by the time that people now in their 20s and 30s get to retire and even some in their early 40s by the time that that happens the amount of support that will be available to them from the state and so forth will be substantially reduced I mean mm-hmm. there there is an aging population issue there is certainly in most parts of the world you know life expectancy is going up and you have to think about that what does that really mean for me I would commend to everybody the 100 year life mm-hmm. by Linda Grattan and Andrew Scott two two professors at the London Business School who wrote a book uh, two or three years ago about what the impact on work would be of people living longer. Now, even if you don't read the book, it's worth going to the website because on the website there's a free diagnostic that if you fill it in, it will tell you how well prepared you are for a long career. And mm. So I would tell everyone to go and do that diagnostic. And one of the things it tells you, interestingly, as well as building economic capital, which is what we're talking about now, and making sure that you're prepared for a long life, is building social capital and investing in your network. Because if you are looking to work for a very long period of time Mm. and having a strong network around you is very, very important. I think, um, I was actually writing notes, it's somewhere in one of these books, that um, that these three types of capital, the the human capital, which you can get from investing in yourself, and we talked about education, the social capital that you can get from actually investing in your relationships, and then also this kind of economic capital you get from the pensions, the salaries, all those sorts of pieces, they come together in in terms of your career at the centre of it, and you have so much control over what that looks like but it doesn't come without effort no it doesn't come without effort and any pool of capital i mean adam smith whose house i've been renovating who lived in the 1700s was very clear to everybody in the things that he wrote 300 years ago that you don't accumulate capital without investment Mm. and in that goes for all of those capitals you don't get a properly funded pension without making decisions to go without some things now Mm. in in order to have that security of income in the future you don't get investment in social capital or build a store of social capital without making that effort to go out in the evening to something that maybe you'd much rather go home and watch your box set but actually you're going to go to this event before you go home to watch the box set because you know that it will be important and Mm. you need to invest the time in it and you don't get to human capital um, which is your increased skills and capability without investing in training Mm. I would add to that a fourth thing which Ah. is that you also need in the world of the fourth industrial revolution where AI and robotics are doing so many things now that you also need to invest in your emotional resilience Mm. and emotional capital and emotional intelligence, empathy, having these kind of skills. And these are going to be the skills of the future and the skills that people are looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a brilliant note to end on. Actually, one more thing before we do is that we always ask people for their best piece of career advice, which there's a thousand pieces of career advice in your book. So I definitely never get anyone to those. But is there is there one thing that people could take away that you think would help them with their careers? I would invest some time in thinking about it. Most people don't ever sit down and think about what they want to achieve. And instead of thinking about what kind of career you want, think about your own impact. What impact do you want to have? I wanted to influence people's careers. That's Mm. what I wanted to do. And at every stage in my life, I've done that in a a different way. So I would say my one piece of career advice to everybody is not what job do you want, but what impact do you want to have? And I would sit down and write it down and I would list your goals and list your ambitions and be very certain that you've set yourself some kind of course for the future. And I don't think it it matters that you don't necessarily get to all of these things immediately. I think it is important, though, to have some kind of visual reminder of where you want to get to Mm. when I got my PhD in 2003 I didn't go to my graduation it was at the University of Hong Kong and I lived a long way from Hong Kong by the time I finished so I never went back but I bought my academic gown and I hung it in my wardrobe and it sat in my wardrobe for the next 13 years reminding me 
that my goal was to get a professorship in a university one day. And every time I went to my wardrobe, there it was hanging. And the, the first time I took it out was for my first graduation ceremony here as the head of the business school reading out names on the stage. But when I got the phone call inviting me to interview here, 13 years after graduating on PhD, I knew because I had this constant reminder that this was my goal, that I should immediately accept that. And I think if you have a stated goals and visual reminders of what you're looking for, I think it's something that will keep your career close to you. And people need to invest in thinking about it just as much as doing it. I feel like I've got a very reflective plane flight home where I'm going to be thinking about what is my visual reminder and where, where am I going to stick it in the nicest sense? Where am I going to put that thing? Thank you so much for your time. Um, we have talked about lots of different links. I'll put on the blog post that accompanies this on amazingif.com. I'll put the links to the books. I will put the links to Edinburgh Business School. I'll put all of the different things we've mentioned, the 100 Year Life. You'll find everything on there. So that'll be a rich source of um, things for you to keep exploring. We're also going to run a competition so you can win one of two copies of the books that we've got. So we've got the Careers Advice for Ambition ambitious women and we've also got the financial advice for independent women so we'll run that competition head over to the instagram page for at amazing if and you'll see that there thank you so much for listening heather thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it it's been lovely to have you here